All right, CRIM 4, here we go on to chapter 11, which is trial procedure. Um, I think I mentioned early on in this semester that this class started off with some really interesting chapters, and then it kind of starts to get a little bit more boring toward the end. But anyways, so this is not the most exciting, but we're going to get through it because it's part of the class. So let's do it. So I can get it to move. Oops. No. There we go. Introduction. Okay, so uh, I remember asking my daughter this, um, if she knew what a trial was. And I kind of just assumed that everybody knows what a trial is, but ultimately, and she did not know, um, Miss Smarty Pants, but anyways, um, she did not know. And um, so ultimately a trial is when a prosecutor lays out all their evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the suspect that they've charged with a crime is guilty. Um, the defense counsel or defense attorneys, their job is to um, protect um, the suspect's rights and hopefully um, be able to cause enough reasonable doubt uh, in the, the trial that um, the, that there's no conviction. So, um, so we've gotten through the entire court process all the way up until the actual trial already. So the last chapter we talked about, talked about juries. So once a jury is cho chosen, the next step is for the trial to begin. And initially, um, Typically, the prosecution, that would be the person that is trying to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is guilty, will go first because they have what's called the burden of proof. It is on, it is the responsibility of the prosecution to show beyond a reasonable doubt that the suspect committed the crime. It is not the responsibility of the suspect to prove that he did not commit the crime. I hope that makes sense because that's a, a really, uh, really important um, concept in this whole uh, this whole deal. So the prosecution typically is going to go first when they have an opening statement. Um, this is a time when they're going to lay out their version of what happened. So um, we would like to say that everything they say is factual, but honestly, it's a prosecution's version of the criminal behavior. And they hope to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt with their evidence and their witnesses and things like that. So, prosecution goes first. <laughs> um, they have latitude, meaning um, during that opening statement, uh, I don't want to say that it, it's not factual information, but sometimes it is not factual information. They are telling a story. They are trying to introduce the jury to what they are going to prove, uh, what they hope to prove. So, um, so like it says here, but the statements are not considered facts in the case. So these are, they are not testifying. They're basically uh, giving an introduction, an opening statement so that they can explain to the jury, this person did this, and this is how we're going to show you that he did this. Okay. So uh, after the, typically again, after prosecution, the defense counsel has the opportunity to do the same thing. They make an opening statement telling their version of the story. Uh, which probably is very different than the, the prosecutor's version of the story. Um, just like anything else, there's two versions to every story. And this is what that is. These opening statements are just introductions so that the jury can have a general idea of what to expect. We talked about this a lot before, uh, but reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt. What is reasonable? So um, in our system, defendant in a criminal court is presumed to be innocent until proven otherwise. So you walk into that courtroom, you are presumed innocent. Then the prosecution has a responsibility to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you are guilty. And when we talk about a reasonable doubt, um, a reasonable doubt wouldn't be something like UFOs came down and, and uh, took over my body for two days while I murdered five people, and then they flew away and left. Um, most people wouldn't call that reasonable doubt. So reasonable doubt is, you got to be pretty stinking sure that, that that's what happened. Um, and I, I like to use my, um, my uh, anyways, uh, my hands to show an example of this, but... Um, Obviously, I don't have my hands on the screen right now, so that's not going to happen. 
Okay. Um, witnesses will come and testify. Uh, witnesses can be lay witnesses. That's like you and me, just people who typically maybe witnessed the crime. Or you can have an expert witness, which could be someone like um, a fingerprint expert. The fingerprint expert was not at the crime, did not witness anything that happened at the crime, but he's an expert on fingerprints. So he will go and testify as to whatever the fingerprint evidence is. Okay, so those are two kinds of witnesses. Lay witness is just a person like you or me who witnessed a crime. And then you have an expert witness who is somebody who is an expert on some area uh, in that's an issue in that uh, trial. So a subpoena. I know this is really how you spell subpoena. S-U-B-P-O-E-N-A. That's subpoena. Um, a subpoena is an order to appear. Um, I've gotten a subpoena before. I can remember working probation. I got a subpoena from the San Francisco County defense attorney um, because one of my former clients uh, who was at Hoover High School apparently um, grew up, went up to San Francisco and killed somebody. So um, they subpoenaed me from Fresno because apparently I witnessed a fight that he was in where he got his butt kicked. And I had to swoop in and grab him and take him into my office so that he didn't continue to get his butt kicked. Um, and I think his point was he, he wanted me to come testify. His attorney wanted me to come testify to say that he had been bullied. Um, and then he went to San Francisco and killed somebody. So anyways, but a subpoena is not an invitation. Um, it is not a would you please appear. It is a you need to appear. Otherwise, you could end up in jail. Okay. Um, if you fail to appear, you could probably be um, held in contempt of court, uh, which means you could be uh, arrested. Witnesses, now, typically that doesn't happen. They don't typically order subpoena. Uh, they don't typically uh, put people in custody for not uh, appearing in court, but they could. So before a uh, witness testifies, they are they have to do their the oath. You know, I do solemnly swear. Um, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, and they put their hand on the Bible and all that kind of stuff, and, or I don't even, I don't think they do the Bible thing anymore. Anyways, every witness still has to um, do this oath or affirmation, basically promising to uh, tell the truth um, and tell the whole truth, um, and if they don't, the purpose of the oath is that they will be charged with perjury, or could be charged with perjury. So, Direct examination. We're going to use that case that I was just talking about, the San Francisco defense attorney who wanted me to go testify um, on behalf of the defendant, the murderer, um, because he thought that I knew some information um, about him. So whichever attorney has subpoenaed me, when they question me, that's called direct uh, examination. So in that particular case, if I had gone up there and testified, when the defense attorney asked me questions, that would have been considered direct examination. If the prosecution followed up with some more questions after that, it would be cross-examination. So figuring out who called the witness that's how you decide whether it's direct examination or cross-examination. If I'm called as a witness by the prosecution, when they are asking me questions on the stand, that is called direct examination. If I'm called by the prosecution and the defense attorney starts asking me questions, that's called cross-examination. I don't know, that makes sense? I hope so, because I know there's a question on the quiz about that. So, um, Attorneys can object to certain questions being asked because for many reasons, maybe they, are, they aren't relevant to the case, that kind of stuff. So um, blah, blah, blah. You have to answer all, okay, let me see, not you. If you are a witness, you are required to answer all questions throughout the time that you are sitting on the stand. Unless you could incriminate yourself of criminal behavior. But otherwise, if you're a witness, you need to answer all the questions. Um, every now and then, um, the judge or jury might have the ability 
to call people as witnesses. So um, I've never seen this happen before, but according to your book, it does. Um, so when witnesses are on the stand, um, a lot of times that's when physical evidence will be um, introduced. They might they might even take a, a jury out to the actual crime scene. I've seen this happen before in some cases where they would all kind of jump, get on a bus or a couple vans, and they would actually drive them out to the crime scene. So, um, so these are some other examination of witnesses. Once the prosecutor prosecutor believes he has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that um, the defendant is guilty, he will rest his case. Okay, so what can happen next if the defense attorney does not believe that the prosecution has proven the case beyond a reasonable doubt? Before he even opens his mouth, meaning the defense attorney, he can ask the judge to dismiss the case. I don't know if that makes sense or not. I hope it does. If the defense attorney thinks that there's not been enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, he doesn't even have to put on a case. He doesn't have to put on a defense because it is up to the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. The prosecution has the burden of proof. Okay. Um, okay, there's all kinds of um, defense presentations. Should the defendant testify is one of those questions. And I think we talked about this before with the uh, Casey Anthony case. Um, this was the woman out of Florida who allegedly killed her three-year-old daughter. Probably happened about 10, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Uh, she did not testify on her own behalf. Um, it was probably the smartest thing that she ever did uh, because she was ultimately acquitted. But there might be times when your uh, defendant might be really unlikable. Um, so uh, Harvey Weinstein is another example. I don't believe he testified on his own behalf. Um, he, he's not a very likable guy. So um, you have the right to testify on your beho own behalf, but you don't have to, and the jury cannot hold it against you if you choose not to. Um, blah, blah, blah. They, all, they can kind of go back and forth. The defense can ask more questions, the prosecution, and that's called rebuttal. Um, sometimes... Um, maybe if there's a, a witness who is unavailable or maybe is too young, they might do something called a deposition, uh, which is where the attorneys um, will question this witness separately um, away from the jury, uh, and they will record uh, the entire um, bit of testimony. Um, burden of proof, we've talked about this, uh, blah, 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 and then the, the, we're going to kind of skip We've talked a lot about the sanity, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, and there are different tests to decide whether or not a person is deemed sane or insane. Um, and we talked about sanity specifically referring to at the time the offense was committed. So these are a couple of the more silly um, defenses that have been used by um, defense attorneys and have actually worked. Uh, the Twinkie defense. Um, it was a case out of San Francisco where a man claimed that he had eaten so many preservatives and so much sugar um, from the, the Twinkies that um, he was uh, not responsible for the crime that he committed. I believe he was, I believe he got away with that. Um, XYY syndrome, this is allegedly a person having an extra um, chromosome. Uh, PMS syndrome, yeah, don't mess with that one. P uh, premenstrual sin uh, premenstrual synd syndrome syndrome. Sorry, oh my gosh. Okay, well, so PMS. Um, this is has been used as a defense by women who were very hormonal, and um, they have absolutely some very few, but they they have uh, some people have been successful. All right, then we can go on to battered spouse syndrome. And this is um, another defense that has been used before successfully. Again, all of these defenses are, it is very difficult to be found not guilty by reason of insanity. So I don't want you to think that these are these are uh, things that are happening in, happening in a courtroom every day. But um, battered spouse syndrome, um, there were women who were saying that they were so fearful of their husbands that they needed to shoot and kill him while he slept uh, in bed at night. And um, 
a few of them did get away with that. And then my favorite, affluenza. So the affluenza case is about a young man who I believe committed a DUI. Uh, I want to say there might have been either great bodily injury or death involved in it. But um, his claim was that he was so affluent or wealthy or rich or spoiled or whatever you want to call it, that he did not know the difference between right and wrong and he should not be held responsible for that uh, criminal behavior. And he, that kid actually uh, was successful in that defense, which is uh, insane. But um, so hopefully I'm going to post a discussion question about him later so that you can uh, read up a little bit more on him. Uh, but these are just some um, defenses that are used occasionally for not the not guilty by reason of insanity defenses. So let's move on. What else do we have? Um, closing arguments, just like the opening statement, closing argument is kind of like wrapping the case up with a little bow and handing it to the jury and saying, this is what we showed you. This is what we told you we were going to show you. This is what we did show you. And this is what you should do now. You should convict him. Or again, the, the defense is going to say just the opposite. Um, they didn't show beyond a reasonable doubt. You should not find him guilty, blah, blah, blah. So everybody kind of wraps up their case at the end during the closing arguments. And then um, it, the case goes off to the jury um, for deliberations. So um, these are just the summary, 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 and we're done.